the people. So today I'm joined by Gillian Simpson, who is the director and writer. I think you're the editor. I mean, you wear a lot of hats on this I one. I did, yeah, and VFX yeah. and costume designer. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so we're here to talk about your new film, Dandelion, which is showing at Sci-Fi London. So, yes. um, Gillian, welcome to the podcast. Thank, Thank you, you for um, giving me your time because you're on holiday right now. So, yeah. you know what I mean? That's a best, that's commitment to your craft. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was very excited about getting into Sci-Fi London. It was one of the ones I wanted to get, you know, because it's, yeah, a uh, big fan. So uh, it doesn't matter that I'm on holiday. I still want to come and talk to you guys. <laughs> <laughs> so is this the um, first film you've submitted to Sci-Fi London? It's the first uh, sort of through the official one. I've done the 40-hour challenge a couple of times and, and never got in uh, through that. Um, but I have, yeah, I've done, I have done the 40 hour challenge a, a few years, I think maybe three times I've done it, um, Okay, but not recently, sadly. <laughs> right, um, right. Yeah, but how, it's always a fun weekend. Yeah. How did you find the challenge? It was good. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. It was like not a lot of sleep and, um, I wore a lot of hats on that one. So editing and VFX and everything on the, those as well. So it was, uh, it was a pretty full on weekend, but the films were always fun and we always had a good laugh and, you know. Um, so yeah, it was a good experience to do it as well. It's just fun to make a film in a weekend, you know. Oh man, I, I I've tried, but it, it's getting that crew together, right? Yeah. It, it's getting people to be like, wait, you want me to do something in forty? Shut up! <laughs> I'm yeah. good. That's stupid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that is hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. But you go to the festival. I haven't actually managed to go to the festival yet. I now really wanted to go this year, but now I'm away on holiday, so I'm missing it again. So I'll have to make it next year. <laughs> so yeah, but I really I wanted to come, but yeah. No, it's always a fun time. It's mm. all, definitely always a fun time. But you know, you got your film showing, which is yeah. a big one. Yeah, very excited about that. Yeah, really chuffed, really chuffed. So yeah, yeah. yeah. So how did the idea you know come for this one um i mean it was quite a long time ago now i was um i'm scottish but i live in london and so i would get the train from london to scotland and back quite a lot and um there's loads of wind turbines on the route and i would just mm. be like sitting staring out the window and i'd just be looking at these wind turbines and i always thought that they were really beautiful but kind of like lonely and weird and just kind of you know like not really fitting in the landscape and it just made me think what would it be like if you lived there and that was kind of like the start of the idea like what kind of person would live there what would be the circumstances to make them live there and you know and just what would their life be like and then um and then my, my mind went in a bit of a dark place. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but that was it the start. Did. It really did. It really did. <laughs> you went yeah. there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, uh, but yeah, that was the start of it. That was just the little first germ of the idea was just seeing these wind turbines and just thinking, hmm, I wonder what the story would be if they, if somebody lived in one of them, you know? Mm. Yeah, I know, because you see them. Right. And they've also got them like out at sea and all yeah. of that. And it is this weird, fascinating thing because they're, they're usually in clumps, right? Yeah. You never see just one on its own. You need a yeah. lot of them to be able to produce electricity. Yeah. But it's just, whoa, like, what is that like? You know what I mean? Being oh. in that right it, it, yeah. you just see things like working in unison and it's, it's it's it is fascinating but yeah i've never like i've yeah i've never seen them and thought i could make a home i could live <laughs> in one of those <laughs> I mean, I thought, you actually couldn't you couldn't live in one because one it's very noisy there i mean it sounds silly to say but it, it's also really windy which makes sense but when yes. we turned up for the shoot it was quite it was like oh it was quite an issue <laughs> the wind but then we should have realized being a wind farm you know <laughs> yeah 
yeah. But uh, yeah, it was. Uh, but we had brilliant weather when we did the shoot, so like it worked. It was really couldn't have gone any better, really. So we were very lucky. Right now, with the noise, like because you know I've lived near train stations and that kind of thing, and you kind of just get used to it. Yeah. Yeah. So do you think it's some? Is it? one of those noises where you feel you could probably get used to it or is it like real loud yeah I mean it's quite loud but I, I liked it and it became quite a big thing in the film the sort of that constant sort of thump thump, thump mm. noise that sort of made the main character kind of you know was driving her a bit mad you know she says you know with those things making that noise it's like it's just like a constant thing like a heartbeat almost um which is sort of a bit of a sort of theme through the uh, the film and our sound recordist on location um, did an amazing job. She was like recording the sound of the wind turbines, like at the wind turbine, away from the wind turbine, like all these different areas. Like she spent an entire evening just recording the sound from every possible place you could get it so that we'd have it for the cut, you know. So, yeah, she was amazing. Uh, that's it. And are they that big? Yeah, I mean, they're pretty big. <laughs> um, you know, like, there's obviously a lot of extra wind turbines added in post uh, in the shots, but the when we had three wind turbines on this farm that we shot on, and so they were we didn't do anything to scale them up or that's that was them. That's how big they were. So um, right. they were pretty impressive. Uh, but it, it kind of reminded me of a lighthouse, right? When you, when you yeah. see her and living it, you'd be like, it's kind of like a lighthouse. Yeah, well, it's funny you say that because the interior stuff was shot on a called the Light Ship, which is in East London, um, and it's a it's a recording studio now. But um, it's a basically a lighthouse on a boat, and so that is where we shot the interior stuff. So that's funny that you say it's like a lighthouse because that's what I thought too. <laughs> <laughs> I've never heard of this light ship. Oh, it's such a cool uh, place. It's just part is like basically opposite the O2 uh, and it's like this it's bright red and it has like recording studios in it quite a lot of really famous people have recorded songs there and uh, music videos there and they were kind enough to let us film there as well so um, but yeah it's called The Light Ship and it, it, yeah it's a pretty cool place. I mean this is so bizarre because I live very close <laughs> to the O2 um, really? yeah <laughs> And I know my eyesight's rubbish, but I f would have thought I'd see this big red thing. Yeah. <laughs> I there. That's crazy. I mean, it was a couple of years ago we shot it, so maybe they painted it. <laughs> maybe it's not red anymore, <laughs> but um, it was definitely red when we were there. So, uh, yeah. yeah it was huh. cool. I'll have to keep an eye out for that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you wanted to explore grief. Yeah. Right. Like, why like what's what was the thing that made you think okay I want to tell this story and let's you know use grief as a framing device well, it was kind of a combination of um like the the wind turbine because it's sort of in my mind is like the breath of the earth and it feels like we're kind of killing the earth at the moment. And so it became, so thinking like that made me think about what it would be to, uh, for when we, you know, as a human being decides to sort of take their own life, you know, and um, what would be the reasons for doing that? And then obviously, and Alice's reason is the grief of losing her family. And it was sort of exploring, you know, if you've lost everything, like, how do you move on? How do you mm. keep going? You know, it's like, how do you keep breathing almost? Um, and so it, it was really sort of like exploring um, that and like, uh, yeah, and just sort of the idea of like, how you have to keep breathing, you have to keep going, you know, it's like, like, like a wind turbine, you have to just keep going and going, and, yeah. you know, it's, it's like, you know, um, so that was, yeah, that was sort of, sort of, thinking of when we were do when we were making it um and like if you've lost everything like should you keep going you know I mean obviously you should mm. but like um yeah it was just like uh, looking at the, her particular situation like quite an extreme loss that she had and her blaming herself for it as well um yeah so it was 
I don't know, like, I don't know if you do spoilers. Like, I mean, it's just, a, <laughs> so I'm trying to, like, tiptoe around for, like, what Yeah, no, I mean. Not that we can go full, you know. <laughs> I don't know. Like, these things, there's sometimes, you know, it's talking about the process of making a film, right? And yeah. I think there's certain things that you can say that don't give it away, certain yeah, themes yeah. you can talk about. But yeah. I kind of leave it up to the, uh, the director, the writers, okay. you know what I mean? The, the yeah, created yeah. themselves to what they want to actually touch upon. Yeah. You know, there's, yeah. I think we can, you know, tip tap toe around because, you know, we see flashbacks, but we don't yeah. necessarily see how the incident happened. Yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. Was that yeah, a conscious it's... choice? Yeah, because, um, you know, we sort of, we obviously see the sort of um, how she loses her family, but we don't see how they sort of, end, how they get to be in the situation that they end yeah. up in. And that was a definite conscious choice because I think it would have just taken too long to explain it. And, you know, and I feel like audiences are smart and you can just imagine what you know what had led to them you know um being up there like it's this little girl and little girls get themselves into trouble <laughs> you know they will wander into places they shouldn't or go climb places they shouldn't and so um yeah i, th I thought it's just for the sake of the storytelling there was no need to show the whole getting up there sort of thing it was more um once you know just to be with them at that moment um in that sort of like you know the worst worst moment of her life um originally it was much much darker the story if you can <laughs> if that's possible um in uh, where alice the main character actually makes a choice at the at that moment like a deliberate choice of of who to sort of mm. like go of and uh but I thought that might have been just taking it a little too far. <laughs> it was a little, <laughs> I got a bit scared going, that's quite a strong thing to do. So I'll make it more accidental. But um, mm. yeah, originally well, it was a bit worse. <laughs> yeah. But what, if you think about it, in that kind of predicament, you would have to make a choice. Yeah. Right. If, yeah. if you're someone like Alice, you know what I mean? If you don't have the strength to, you know what I mean? Hold two yeah. people. You have to, there's a choice will have to be made. Yeah, yeah. And the issue is that she didn't make a choice, and that's why mm. she lost them both. Really, you know, it was yeah. it was her lack of being able to choose that caused you know that was the that caused the ultimate um, problem. So um, yeah, I mean, yeah, not not a not a situation many people find themselves in. I wouldn't imagine. <laughs> No, but hopefully, yeah. hopefully, and, but, and, the, and the crazy thing is, whatever you know, what I mean, choice you make, the ramifications are still gonna be the same, yeah, yeah. right? You're still gonna be wrapped with guilt and yeah. just replaying those moments over and over again, yeah, you know, 100%, just, yeah, like, oh, dark, yeah, it was, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's a bit dark. <laughs> mm. But I like dark, you know, it's it's uh, interesting to explore that, I think. Oh, for sure. Yeah, no, it's uh, I think because it makes you ask those questions. You know what I mean? Like, what would you do in that situation? Yeah. You know what I mean? How would you play? How would you cope with that? Like, who would you choose to save? Yeah. Could you make that choice? Like you, you ponder all of those things. Now, obviously, right? There's a lot of times when people in their head would be like, "Ah, oh, I would do this," but then when push comes to shove, I don't do nothing. You know what I mean? But yeah, it's always I think seeing these kind of things, it, it it's an interesting uh, thing, right? Because it makes you ponder. Yeah. It starts those conversations. Yeah, yeah, and that's why I don't. I didn't really have a definitive ending. Like I've, I really left it for the audience to decide how it ends and what choice she makes at the end. You know, when she's standing there, it's like that. It could go one of two ways. You know, and so mm. I sort of I deliberately cut it before you saw what happened, so that the audience can decide for themselves. You know, what yeah. they would do if they were her. I guess. So I know what I would do. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. Oh, man. Like, you, you feel there's only one choice for her, but who knows, right? Yeah. Everything, yeah. everything changes. I I spoke to a guy, Um, oh, God, I cannot remember his surname. It's Kevin something. And he jumped off the Golden, uh, Golden Gate Bridge. And he survived. Wow. And it's... And a lot of things is like sometimes people survive, but then they're paralyzed or, you know what I mean? It's, it's mm. You know, luckily for him, he he wasn't, he you know, he can walk, he, he's fine on that front. Yeah. But it's like, um, he said, and I've heard it so many times, the minute you step off, you regret it. Yeah. Yeah, I've heard that as well, yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's, it's just like the minute you're like, actually, actually, no, 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 no. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's yeah. just like, oh, you know, it, it's, yeah. it's that. Kind of, and I also with pills, the amount of the stories I've heard of people that swallow the pills and then be like, actually, I don't want to die. Can you pump my stomach? And they're like, it's too late. Yeah. Oh, God. Yeah. Uh, everything's dissolved into your system. There's nothing we can do. And that's just gonna yeah. be a painful last few hours which is yeah. rough yeah that's awful yeah yeah mm. yeah know. with the writing of this yeah what were those kind of struggles what was the process to kind of you know put those thoughts on paper and make it feel real yeah, I mean, when I, I first wrote, it's not actually that different from my first draft, but it's been through a lot of different <laughs> versions and kind of came back to my original um, thing. I, like, originally I had a lot more about the Lazarus device that's in her arm. Um, right. I had a lot more explaining what that was, a lot bigger kind of, like a whole scene. There was a whole bit where she got arrested because suicide was illegal uh and there was a whole scene there but it just became it became like a feature film like it just became too big and mm. i just and and so every time i tried to sort of rewrite it to sort of make it um have more in it it just it's made it made it more complicated and um i just wanted to tell a simple story and so i and eventually i ended up taking out a lot of the the things that i put in um and i've got i'm not a writer um and I have friends who are writers, and so I also they read it and gave me feedback. And um, I'm a big believer in like collaboration. And you know, I don't think, although I've done a lot of the role, the jobs on this, I do think you need lots of people, you know, um, input and things like that. So uh, I got some really good feedback from people, um, which I took on board. And um, yeah, there was one line that I took out that one of my friends who's a really good writer said, you don't need that line. And when I took it out, it just the whole thing just worked for me. So, um, yeah, it was, it was just, it was a really simple line, but it just made a huge difference removing it. So, um, yeah. Uh, so yeah, it didn't, it, so it ended up being similar to my first draft, but had gone a big journey before then. <laughs> mm, mm. Well, I think sometimes, yeah, that, that happens a lot, right? Because you're, yeah. you're writing stuff and you think, actually, I could make it better. Or it's that whole, well, I'm going to sit with it for a while because I think I could, you know, I could maybe mm. improve it. And so then you go, oh, let's try this. Let's add in this. Let's boom. But then, you know, when you actually break it down, it's just like, yeah, essentially you had it on that yeah. first pass through. But you know, I, I don't think it hurts. To... No, I think it, yeah, definitely is good to, you know, because it isn't exactly the same as the first pass. You have to kind of mm. take on that journey, don't you? Um, yeah. And I did sort of leave it for a year and then go back to it. Like I had it writ sort of written for quite a long time before I actually made it. And then um, obviously I made it like kind of around COVID time. So that was, uh, gave me time to actually finish it. Um, so uh, yeah, I made the most of having, you know, being at home all the time to sort of finish it off and so that I could make it uh, eventually. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Now, this is the third directorial effort, right? 
Uh, I suppose technically it is. I think of it as my first proper one because um, it's the first one that had a decent budget and a big crew and shoot. You know, I'd like my first film I ever made was only about four minutes long and I did everything myself and like had a couple of friends help, but it was really a one man band. And then I, uh, I shot a little segment for this uh, very strange but funny feature film um, that one of my friends had kind of got me involved in. Um, called, I can't remember the name of it, it had a really long name. <laughs> um, it's like the, the yeah, anyway, was the, the, the point of it was that every, all these directors shot a little different segment in the film. Um, and oh, put it, all together. it was the transformations of the That's... transformations of Doctors Jenkins. That was it. Yes, it was a very. It was during lockdown. It was a very fun project where everyone just filmed a little scene and it all made this one big film. And if, I would definitely recommend watching it because yeah, it's very funny. Um, and it's kind of like filmmaking gone wrong, <laughs> I would say. <laughs> and uh, and my piece is like very bizarre. <laughs> um, but yeah, it was it was some fun thing to do. So yeah, so technically it's my third directing, um, but first what I call my first proper film. Uh, yeah. Right, right. But do you think those other occasions helped influence how you approach this one? Um, I definitely, yeah, I definitely think it gave me confidence to to actually make it because you know it's quite difficult to make a short film, um, you know, because you have to get the crew together and the story and the locations and you know and and to feel like you don't want to waste everybody's time because um, mm. a lot of time people in short films are doing it for like low pay or no pay. Um, I mean, I was really like. I really wanted to pay everybody on this. So everybody did get something, but it wasn't, you know, a yeah. lot like these things are. Um, but I think it just gave me the confidence to think I can do this and not let them down and, you know, hopefully make a film that everybody likes and feels was worth their time. Um, that was, yeah, that was the main thing I got from the the first two films, I think. Mm. And your, you know, your backgrounds in VFX, where you yeah. have... God damn, you have worked on like some crazy huge projects. I've been very lucky, yeah, with my VFX. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, is it luck, right? There's obviously you're talented. So if, if you if if you weren't talented, you weren't you're not getting a gig, right? They're not bringing just any old person onto uh, House of Dragons. You know what I mean? I can shine well, a torch, <laughs> but you know I, mean? I can color. I, I don't think I'm getting, <laughs> they're bringing me on. You know what I mean? So it, it, it's like it's the skill that's got you to those places. Yeah, I know it's been, you know, it's fun. I really love, my, I, I call it my day job. <laughs> but, you know, I love, uh, you know, doing VFX. It's uh, it's fun. And, you know, I was a huge Game of Thrones fan. So get to get to work on House of the Dragon, um, you know, was like a, a dream job, really. Mm. So, yeah, it's been a lot of fun. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed that. It's been good. And, you know, it's, I kind of got into VFX so that I could become a director because I saw what Gareth Edwards did and obviously, you know the sci-fi uh, festival has knows Gareth yeah. Edwards very well, um, <laughs> and that's why I wanted to uh, do VFX because he started with VFX and he, you know, when he did monsters, he did all the VFX himself pretty much, and you know he was shooting elements in his bath at home, and I'm like I've done that, and it just was really inspiring for me, and so that's literally the reason I got into VFX because I wanted to sort of follow his path, um, so that I could make a short film but actually do the visual effects myself so that I can mm. take it to that next level you know without having to spend loads of money yeah um, so yeah that's kind of what I'm trying to do <laughs> but I've got a long <laughs> way to a long way to go before I get to like you know Rogue One and uh, Jurassic Park sort of standards but um yeah I maybe but you know it, it's I think it's one of those funny things right where you hear about people and it's always kind of played like, oh, that's their big, that's the first thing they ever did, right? Oh man, it's so successful. The first thing they did, and it's this and boom. But when you look into it, they've made 
a load of stuff, right? A, written a yeah. load of books, made a load of shorts, worked on smaller projects. You know what I mean? So there's so much that goes into it. Yeah. And it it can take a while. But you know what I mean? As long as you stick to your guns, right? You can always get there. Yeah. Yeah, hopefully. <laughs> mm. That was the plan. Yeah. <laughs> Did that background, you know, was that another reason that you were confident about making this film? Yeah, I have to say, because, the you know, trying to explain to everybody how we were going to shoot on top of a wind turbine um, was quite difficult because nobody could really understand initially like how we were going to do it because they'd read the script and they'd be like, but we're on top of a wind turbine and my DOP, she was desperate to actually film on top of the wind turbine, but we weren't, and there was no way we were allowed to do that. And also I'm really scared of heights. So I was like, you're on your own. Like, I'm not going up there. <laughs> um, but she, yeah, Angela, she was like, oh, she so wanted to go up there. She was fearless. But, uh, but because I have my VFX background, I knew exactly how I could film it and how I could edit it and everything to make it seem like we were on top of a wind turbine. And um, I used uh, Unreal Engine, which is kind of like a game software to plan mm. how I was going to shoot it all. So I so I did, so for the wind turbine, I bought three corner bath units for like 50 quid each. Um, and I put them together with like white gaffer tape and I put them on top of a table in the middle of this wind field. And then, um, yeah, and so I I did that in the virtual, in like the, the digital sort of Unreal Engine world as well and created the whole thing and put cameras and checked the angles and sort of storyboarded it within Unreal so that I knew really, I was really confident when we went to the shoot, even though everyone thought I was insane when I brought out these bath things and they were like, what are you doing? <laughs> and I was like, it's going to work, honestly, like, believe me, it's, it's going to work. And so I'm actually really proud of the stuff on top of the turbine because it did turn out exactly how I thought it would. Like, um, yeah, I was really pleased that my sort of crazy bath idea worked in the end, you know. Well, yeah, when I read that you used baths, I was like, what the <laughs> hell? <laughs> like, that's great, but it works. Yeah, no, because I was, we had all these different, like, with loads of sort of, uh, with the DOP like trying to figure out how we're gonna do this and I you know I was thinking well we'll just get something round and plastic <laughs> and she was like went to we found a horse box that might have worked and then there was all these like top of vans and like we'd come up with all these different solutions but then once we'd caught you know once I'd thought of the bath thing it was like oh well that'll that's perfect you know the, um for the sort of round whiteness of the top of the wind turbine mm. um and yeah I think it worked I think it worked really well so uh, yeah and then my my brother actually is a drone pilot and so he got all the drone shots for us as well which was really amazing to be able to uh... have the big wide shots too um yeah so it's it was like we got very lucky on the day <laughs> with the weather and everything being able to do that <laughs> oh man yeah no it's, it's definitely an interesting shot so it's it's great to be able to hear how you did it. Like, have you saved all of that kind of um I don't know? Like the Unreal you... Engine stuff. Like yeah, the... yeah. Yeah, I have, yeah. Yeah, I do want I'm going to do like a little um like VFX breakdown of it at some point, but um like I've only just finished on House of the Dragon, so it was pretty full on, so I haven't had a chance to do it. So once I, I've had some time off, I'll go back and uh, yeah, I thought I would uh, put together a little a breakdown of it just because uh, it was fun, you know, going from the, the beginning concept right the way through to the shoot. So um, mm. yeah, it's good to see how it was done. Well, I think, yeah, it, it's getting that technique, right? That technical like input would be fascinating I imagine for a whole heap of people but we'll show it's a really good display of problem solving yeah you know what I mean because it's just like you'll you have a vision right we've got these people on top of a wind turbine but we can't shoot on top of what so how do we work that out right and so being able to come up with this solution 
that's a that's a huge one and you know what i mean because i think a lot of people nece wouldn't necessarily have gone to baths yeah so <laughs> you know what i mean so you have to show that right yeah. and for people you know up and coming vfx directors you know all of these producers to be able to see something like that i think that's that's a valuable tool yeah and i also think it's it's you know because if we had a really big budget then you would just build it some you know we'd build the top of the wind turbine somewhere you know mm. and you would have like you would do you know in a in a blue screen studio or something and it would cost like so much money to do that so i think that the limits of your budget sometimes helps the creativity yes. you know um like i always think of jaws you know because the shark didn't work in jaws and so they had to come up with all those solutions to sort of show the shark without actually showing the shark so and that i think made the film better because you had to imagine the shark yourself and so it was obviously a lot scarier um and so i always think you know just try and find some lo-fi way of doing it if you can um it doesn't need to be like the big budget way no no definitely and yeah jaws is always a great example because i think if that had worked right if, you know i don't think this film would have been the film everyone's talking about yeah right? no because i don't think so either the suspense is in not seeing the shark. Yeah. Right? It's like an alien. It's not yeah. seeing the alien. Right? Again, with Event Horizon, not seeing yeah. the threat makes you like... <sighs> <laughs> yeah. What's happening? What's happening? And then when you do see it, you're like... <gasps> You know what I mean? Like, but if yeah, you've yeah. seen it all the way through, you're just like, eh, it's a shark. Like, oh, exactly. Happened? Yeah. Yeah. No, it's uh, so yeah. I'm like, I like the problem solving side of filmmaking. It's fun to come up with solutions that are maybe not um, normal. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Now, how did your cast find this whole experience, and how did you um, yeah, get this cast? Because they do so a very I, good job. Yeah, they're great. Oh, I was so lucky with them. Um, I got a, a casting director actually because I was like I don't really know much about casting I'd never really made a film with anyone in it other than me <laughs> and so I hadn't worked with actors before and so I got a, a casting director um, and she sent me you know I said what kind of people you know I was looking for ages and sexes and stuff like that and she sent me through a bunch of uh, like a lot I went through a lot of like um self-tapes and stuff like that and people were like kind enough to send things through and just when I saw um Susan uh I mean Susan was amazing um when she sent her tape through like she was like there was no it was instant sort of like oh that's Alice um and uh yeah and the rest of the cast were the same like they were just uh um my mind has completely gone blank on the <laughs> on the guy's name um Oh, oh, that's it terrible. Was, um, I can tell you, I've got it on screen. Dan Daniel Hippolyte. Daniel. Yes. So, yeah, Daniel, oh, he was amazing. He sent me a self tape through the steering wheel of his car when he was filming something else. <laughs> and <laughs> I remember getting the tape, and the uh, Joe, the, the casting director, was like, it's a, not the greatest quality sort of thing. But then, but it was, it was so good. Like, I could just see him um, in the role. And so, uh, yeah, he was great. And then um, the wee girl, um, Mika, I think her name was, she just, I mean, like, how could you not cast her? She was so cute. Because <laughs> you wanted somebody that's going to break your heart, you know? Mm. So, uh, yeah, she was amazing. Um, oh, God, yeah. Seeing her on top of the bloody window, it was just like, oh, oh no, no. I know. You, oh, but she don't. was having so much fun filming. <laughs> like, she was just laughing the whole time. She was, like, sliding up. It was like being on a slide first. So she's sliding up and down these bad things, and I'm trying to get her to sort of be scared, and she just wasn't scared at all, so... You don't see her face a lot in those scenes. <laughs> One scene you see her and she's smiling, but you know. Uh, but yeah, she was so she was having a lot of fun. So that was it was a fun day. That was a very fun day of shooting. Um, with them just lying on top of the on the uh, on the baths. Um, and they and yeah, they really they all got really into it. Um, and uh, and Susan, when we were shooting the flashback stuff, it was like one of the first things we shot. Uh, was her sort of being pinned down on that table mm. and 
up until that point, she hadn't had any dialogue to say or, you know, we hadn't shot anything. And she just went, like, released this scream that the whole, everyone got, like, goosebumps, you know. It was, like, it was amazing watching her do that scene. Like, it was such a visceral, you know, um, reaction that she had. And, uh, yeah, it was just, yeah, it was she was amazing. Yeah, I got really lucky with the cast. They were just perfect. Mm. And... When you were like envisioning the cast, did you have a certain a type that you had in mind, or were you just like, no, we just want you know a a, a mother, a, her husband, and a and a kid? I mean, I didn't even have that in mind. I knew obviously the the kid, but I didn't even when I was casting, I wasn't even thinking about traditional husband wife roles. I was if two women had come up that I thought had worked would work together as a couple then that you know I was very open to sort of mm. having um you know same sex uh partners like um it was just about the people really the who I thought would be best in the roles and it just happened to be that it was a man and a woman but I when I was casting I was I didn't really have them down as like because um Jamie's a very sort of uh could be either male or female name and i deliberately yeah. had that in the in the script as like a kind of uh because i really like girls names that are boys names <laughs> um and so i was like well it could be a boy or a girl you know um mm. so i was quite uh, open uh, yeah when i was doing it okay you're you're in the brian fuller camp of things <laughs> <laughs> uh, though i've never heard of a girl called Michael before. So that was interesting. Is, uh, um, the, the Brian Fuller, he did, um, oh, I, I want to say it's Dead Like Me. It was about oh, a little yeah, girl. I've seen Dead Like Me, yeah. Yeah, yeah it's, it's great. Yeah. It's a yeah, great it's really good, yeah. 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 And um, yeah, so it, I think it was George in that one. Right, yeah. Then he had another one, uh, something about a, a waterfall which I didn't see that, but he did, um, he was a showrunner for the first se Well, he left, I think halfway through of the first season of Star Trek Discovery. Oh, okay. And yeah. the, the lead character is called Michael, Michael uh -huh. Vernon, I want to say, right, yeah. but it's a woman. And, yeah. but he has a thing of, he likes his leading lady to have a male name oh. to kind of shape things up to be like yeah. ah, you know what I mean to kind of be like oh you thought you were getting no nah, you're getting this yeah type yeah. Of thing. yeah well I get yeah I guess I'm a bit like that as well I've always liked sort of you know names that could be male or female so um yeah I'm sure it won't be the last uh time I do that <laughs> <laughs> uh -huh. no but I think that's it's always interesting you know with casting like how people approach it and that openness to you know the different type of person who could play a character you know mm. we definitely got some really interesting ones right there's I think one of the crazy ones was uh Stuart Townsend was meant to be arrogant in Lord of yeah. the Rings yeah yeah and I'm just like, I am so glad <laughs> <laughs> that did not happen. I mean, yeah. I just can't see him as arrogant. And Vigo just, oh my days, oh, yeah. he, he just owned that role. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And then yeah. you hear like, um, oh my god, I forget to do Eric Schultz. Eric Schultz was meant to be Marty McFly. Oh yes, yeah, yeah. I remember and that, that would have well, been yeah. very different. And he shot the first couple of weeks of the film as well. Yeah. And like, then they, you know, it's quite brave to recast when you've already mm. like sort of started shooting. Yeah, yeah. I always yeah. think of um, Degree Scott was meant to be Wolverine. Oh you know, shit! I didn't know yeah. that. Yeah, he was cast and then he injured himself in a bike accident, I think, and he wasn't able to do it. And so then Hugh Jackman got it. And you just think, well, I'm, sh you know, I think Diggory Scott's an amazing actor, but now you've got Hugh Jackman as Wolverine, you couldn't imagine anybody else, you know. So, huh. yeah, I mean, 
it's an interesting one. Like, there's, I don't think Dickory Scott's a bad actor, mm. but I think he works best in certain roles. Yeah. Like certain type of characters. You know what I mean? And I, I can't envision him. But I don't know. Like, I don't. Hugh Jackman as Wolverine is is okay. He was really good in Deadpool and Wolverine. Yeah. That, yeah oh, my awesome. God. I hated the first dead two Deadpool films. Really? Oh wow! I just <laughs> because my thing was right because it's playing up the whole superhero trope and all of that, but I kind of felt they were too late to the party because we'd already had things that did that, so it just yeah. felt a bit, you know, forced. But Deadpool and Wolverine, they just nailed it. They yeah. nailed it with that film. That was incredible. Yeah. But my thing with Wolverine, there's in the comics, Wolverine is short. I uh, see. I knew you were going to say it because I never read the comics. So I had no, I've got no preconceived idea of what yeah. Wolverine should yeah, look yeah, like. Yeah, yeah. So I just am like, Hugh Jackman, that's amazing. That's an amazing character. He's amazing, <laughs> isn't it? But I've I'd never read the comics. So I, I hear this quite a lot from people. They're like, ah, but Wolverine's meant to be like 5'2 or something. <laughs> I don't mm. know, you know, and that's not Hugh Jackman. So I see the problem. No. I mean, and it, it's not necessarily wanting it to be exactly like the comic book. Because, uh, you know, I didn't read a whole heap of X-Men comics. That wasn't my comic. You know what I mean? Mm. But I'm just like, <sighs> we, you could have shaken it up a little bit, right? Because he's not necessarily attractive and all of this. So instead of, because you've got Cyclops, you've got Angel, you've got, you know, all of these characters. You know what I mean? Put someone different up in there, right? Yeah. Just to show the diversity of casting. Like yeah. I think that would have been interesting. Mm. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I I love Hugh Jackman. I can't say anything bad against him. That he's a good actor. I I think yeah. he's a he's a very good actor. You know what I mean? But, yeah. 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 <laughs> it, it, it was just that one I, I found interesting but uh yeah. no your your cast do a very good job and mm. man i i think especially right susan um jane robinson yeah because there isn't a whole heap of dialogue in that, the film yeah. so she's having to portray so much with like body language yeah. And um, her, just her presence, yeah. So, what kind of work did you do with her to be able to convey all of this? I mean, we talked a lot about um, the character and what she was going through. I had quite a large backstory for her um, that you know we talked about um, that's not mentioned in the film at all. But I had her mm. basically our whole life story kind of like mapped out, like how she had got to where she was and how she ended up with Jamie and, you know, this whole thing. And she hadn't had, like, the best life, you know. Um, it, it only sort of got good when she met Jamie. So that yeah. was quite an important character thing that she'd, you know, he was the only good thing she'd really ever had. And so that was why it was such a bad thing to have lost them, you know, because it was all she had in the world, really, was the two of them. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, we talked a lot about that. and um, But also, like, I'm not an actor i don't i could never act it's not my thing at all and i have a, so much admiration for people that do so i was very much like you know i trust you to, you know that you know the character and i trust the choices that you'll make um with her uh, and so there wasn't a lot of like directing it might have just been um you know try it sort of a slightly different way or a bit sadder or uh a lot of the stuff when she's on top of the turbine when you where you're sort of trying to imagine what she's thinking. There was a, we talked a lot about what was going through her head at that point and the choice, you know, that she was making, and um, and then sort of I suppose a lot of the direction was just things like you know look at your hands and look up and more just like action uh, yeah. directing. But because you know obviously I trusted her so much um, and her ability that a lot of it, 
you know, she did and it was great and we didn't really um, play about too much with it, uh, which was good because obviously, you know, short films, don't you don't have a lot of time. Um, so you do really want to get it in the first few takes. Whenever we didn't do loads and loads and loads of takes of things, you know, um, it was just like three or four and then move on. <laughs> so, um, but yeah, that's that's why it was so great to have such a great actress because, you know, I could trust trust the character in her hands. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, um, I think that whole backstory, that makes a lot of sense, right? And it makes a lot of sense to write that, to have that in mind, because it would play into the character. Like, the yeah. audience doesn't have to know it all. But I think for someone to portray someone, knowing that is very vital, because, you know, yeah. for her, like, those reactions, because I, I think as the film opens up, right, she's in bed, and we have a get up, and just the body movements, right, reaching for that item of clothes, like, you could tell straight away that, oh, she's experienced some grief. Yeah, yeah. Right? And, and I think knowing all of that stuff enables you to really bring that out. Yeah, you yeah, know? definitely. And like, yeah. It felt like that opening scene, so that scene was meant to be a one all the way from when she wakes up to when she walks out of the wind turbine. Um, right. But when we got to the location where the steady cam, it didn't fit up the stairs. Because <laughs> oh, it was oh, really no. tiny. <laughs> It was, and it wasn't safe for him to do it, and so we had to like do it in a couple of. But it was originally envisaged as a huge one shot, sort of going from her in complete darkness into this in, in this small space into this big huge space. Mm. Um, I still think it worked, but it wasn't exactly what it was meant to be. But um, yeah, I really felt like she had the feeling of weight on her when she wakes up. You feel like she's got mm. kind of this dark weight, heavy on her, and and yeah, and it's amazing that she could do that without saying a word you know you could just feel it um from her movements like yeah she was amazing yeah is i think if there's, there's loss right but if you didn't have anything and that was the first bit of happiness for you mm. oh, that's gonna be so heavy yeah. And I and I think that's what you get. That's the emotions that you feel when we first meet Alice and we're watching this film. You know, yeah. So yeah, no, I think that was great. Like, where did you kind of learn to do that? Right? Had you did it just seem like the natural thing to do? Had you heard another director talk about, you know, writing out the histories for everything? Um, I, you know, I went to film school to do visual effects and we had a motion capture uh, section where we worked with uh, an actress who did a lot of motion capture, you know, where you wear the suit with the balls yeah. on it. And um, we were writing a scene for her to do. Uh, and when we were doing it, she said, now come up with, you know, we had this one little scene. She's like, but what's happening before this? What happens after this? Like, how do we get into this scene? What happens after we leave this scene? And so we had this tiny little scene with a puppet. But before I come up, I before we shot it, I'd come up with an entire feature length film based around this one five minute scene <laughs> that was really simple. Um, and I never really forgot that. It was because it made me, you know, like I actually still have that written down as an idea because it might make a good feature film one day. Um, but, you know, it was just really helpful when we were shooting that little scene to know everything that had come before then and everything that was going to come afterwards. And uh, so when I was writing Dandelion, I kind of did the same thing. I was like, right, how did we get here? You know, what have all the characters gone through? And then what happens afterwards as well? Um, so I had a really, it was just a small section of of their life. I had their whole everything else all in my head already so um so then it was easier to write because i could write knowing what they're they were feeling you know mm. yeah no that makes a lot of sense yeah um, slight tangent okay. with those suits 
what is the need of the balls? It's like, uh, I mean, it's like tracking points. So, you know, um, a computer can take their, the, where the balls are and use them to track. So you can then digitally have a version of that person in a computer, you know, because they're not, they're going to end up becoming like a robot or a mm, mm. dinosaur or a dragon, you know, or whatever it is that they're pretending, you know, to, to act out or like for gaming, especially um, it's a big yeah. thing. Um, the motion capture. In fact, Susan does a lot of motion capture for games. Um, she's, yeah, she's done quite a lot of that. But yeah, it's basically a marker to mark a point in the in the space for the computer to be able to animate, like to copy the animation of the actor. I'm not explaining okay. it very well, but that's basically it. No, 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 no. <laughs> I, I get it. I get it. Yeah. No, that, that's oh, okay. Because if they were just wearing like a black suit, then there's nothing for the computer to really hook on to you need to have that contrast of like the balls on them um or the points i don't think they're really balls anymore that they use it's more uh sort of tracking points that they have so it's pretty uh, clever <laughs> okay no that 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 makes a lot of sense that makes a lot of sense mm. awesome <laughs> oh dear oh dear now when you're writing something and there's not a whole heap of dialogue yeah what is that like is, is there different constraints in you know your what the script is like compared to you know a traditional script let's say i mean i suppose because i'm also directing it i write a lot of the direction in the script uh, you know, I imagine how I would shoot it and sort of the actions that they would do. So there's a lot of, um, you know, just lots of paragraphs of what happens <laughs> mm. um, in the scene, sort of the actions that they do, maybe their thoughts um, are in there as well. And then maybe I'll add in, you know, what the camera, you know, sort of like the, when I said I had that one shot that was a one -er, like I had that written in the script as a one -er, um things like that. So, uh yeah, I actually find dialogue a lot harder to write. Okay. <laughs> um, I don't know why, but yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not really a writer. That's that's why. Um, I'm more of a visual person, so I can <clears> see <throat> it, but not hear it. If he's, if that makes sense. But yeah, yeah, no, definitely. Yeah, yeah. Um, I had a lot more dialogue in it actually, and it got cut way, way back because it was just. I even shot more. Um, but it got yeah, I cut quite a lot of it in the edit, so. Uh, yeah. Uh, oh, interesting. Yeah, a bit simple. Mm, mm. No, but I I think a lot of times less is more, right? Yeah. And I, I I oh god, who did I speak to? Um, oh, I think it's Erica Offini. I right? she had a film, Dirty Bad Good. I believe that's what it was called. It played at um. Oh, Fantasia. And oh. at the in the closing, it was a closing scene with the mother and the daughter. And she I think she said that there was meant to be this whole conversation. But she, in the edit, like with you, she realized actually, if I take that out, it's a such a more powerful scene. And I remember what when I originally just first watched it, I was just like, yo, this, the way it ends is so powerful. And I remember just talking to her about it. I'm like, yo, the ending was so powerful. And she was just like, oh, yeah, there was meant to be a load of dialogue and I just cut it out. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. I, yeah. I, I, no, I did. Yeah, it's a similar, mm. similar thing. It was like there was just a lot of exposition and I just thought I don't need it, you know. It's just going on too long and the audience will be lost and bored. <laughs> so, yeah, best to just keep it simple, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Eleven, this is just under 12 minutes, essentially. Yeah. Like, yeah. was that a conscious effort to do um, it, uh, you know, in the, that kind of time frame? Uh, I mean, not conscious. I, I definitely just... I wasn't really aiming for a length it just made it whatever length it needed to be but I'm also like I used before I did VFX I was an editor so I let I think things should always be shorter than they are <laughs> <laughs> so, 
so uh, yeah, I uh, I w I didn't want it to feel like it was dragging at any point or like you know too long, and so I definitely wanted to keep it kind of um, as tight as possible, you know. Um, yeah, so yeah, I didn't aim. I think I was about eleven pages when I wrote it, so it kind of works out a minute a page. So you know, right, um, right. Yeah, it was it wasn't uh, it wasn't too far off what I was aiming for. Yeah. Oh man, I've I've watched a few things lately where I'm wish someone would be like, yeah, let's cut this back a bit. Yeah, I I watched when I go to the cinema quite a lot. I think this could be half an hour shorter. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Oh my yeah. gosh. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I never went to one of those filmmakers where somebody's sitting there going, "This is too long." You know, <laughs> nobody mm -hmm. ever sits and thinks a film's too short, do they? So no. No, oh, I mean, I have seen some films and been like, oh, I wish there was more, right? Oh, not yeah. that, well, yeah, that yeah. not that it was like, oh, this didn't tell the story, but I'm just like, I enjoyed that so much. I wish, I wish there was more. I wish we could have yeah. explored this and we could have done that. Uh, yeah. You know what I mean? But yeah, definitely, yeah. you walk out of so many, and you're just like, I mean, we did. Did we need that chase? Like, what was? Yeah. What was that? You know, what was that fight sequence? And you know, we could have yeah, cut out yeah. 40 minutes here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now you've worked on a whole heap of films, right? And TV shows and everything like that. Yeah. Do you think that a feature is in your future soon? I mean, maybe not soon, <laughs> but definitely at some point I would love to do a feature. I have one written, um, so yeah, it's just you know they're they're difficult to make, um, and yeah, I think you know I'd hope to get it made at some point in the future. But it's just I'm going to keep going with the shorts and you know and see where they take me. And uh, I've got another short that I'm doing this year, um, and. Yeah, hopefully every every film gets me one step closer to making that feature film. You know, that's the ultimate goal. Um, yeah, to make to make a feature and then another one, and you know, and just mm, just mm. make film. Basically, make films. You know, for a living. That's that's the dream. Yeah, ah, not so, a bad one to have. Not yeah. um, with this upcoming show. Is it another sci-fi, or are we jumping into another genre? It is another sci-fi, actually. Um, after this one, I said I wasn't going to do a film with lots of VFX in it because I did all of. There was over a hundred VFX shots in this in this oh shot. <laughs> um, <laughs> and it took me a long time to do it because I did them all myself and work uh, after work and, and nights and weekends and stuff. And so I thought the next one's going to be no VFX, but mm. it's actually set at uh, at the end of the world with a black hole. Uh, <laughs> And uh, so it's all totally sci-fi with loads of VFX and um, yeah, so I'm completely, <laughs> um, but it's a much simpler story, um, but again, it's sort of two people, um, yeah, but I think it's, I didn't write it, which will mean it'd be much better, <laughs> um, the writer on it is an amazing writer and so he's done a, a, such a good job with it and so I'm really excited to get that made this year at some point and hopefully people will see it in the next year or so uh, once it's... Okay finished yeah you think you'll be submitting that for next year's sci-fi london i mean that way uh, i might not be get be able to get it for next year's sci-fi london because again there's a lot of the effects but definitely the year after if not if not next year's definitely uh yeah so it's called starry night so look out for it <laughs> uh -huh. well yeah no definitely oh and one last thing just before i let you go okay were you know pertaining to sci-fi right because it's always interesting when you watch it because i feel like it's what someone can imagine right it's their inventiveness to what scale yeah. of sci-fi we see and also the budget right is is involved so mm -hmm. when dealing with sci-fi like what is your kind of approach what is your kind of thought behind it with uh, like you know spaceships rocket ships or just more those 
subtle little touches. I mean, I suppose I'm definitely more towards the subtle side of things. Like, you know, there's not a lot of sci-fi elements in my film. Um, I really like simplicity. Um, and, and, you know, as long as it's relevant to the story, you know, because I could just set this in like some big futuristic world with like mm. in spaceships and everything like that. But then all my time would have been taken up doing that and I wouldn't have had time to do the rest of it properly. You know, so I think especially with small budget, if you can do, I really believe in doing something simply really well than something complicated badly. You know, yeah. I think that's the best way to approach things. So it's sort of, it is very much dictated by the budget and the time that you have. Um and when, like, with storytelling, I just think that the sci-fi sort of just comes naturally into telling the story. You know, it's it's not something, I don't try and force it in there because I want to make a sci-fi film. You know, it's just, I want to make a film. It just happens to have sci-fi in it. Mm. Yeah. Okay. Well, fantastic. Yeah. Well, Jitlian, this has been great. Thank you. It's so much for your time um oh, taking at a all. Break it's been fun <laughs> no i've enjoyed it it's been good to talk awesome well oh. how can people keep track of everything you're doing you know so they can um see uh dandelion um you know if they miss it at sci-fi london and keep a track of like starry night uh so i have uh uh, website it's dead unicorn films uh, dot com and that's where i've tra have all my films on there and then when dandelion is um up on you know just normal uh, uh streaming sites you'll be able to get it there at the moment it's still password protected because it's still doing the festival stuff but um it, by the end of the year i imagine it will be it will be available for everyone to see and my other shorts on there as well um and also information about upcoming films and also i'm on instagram on the uh, gls underscore vfx and that's where i put all my stuff as well so uh, and also my holiday stuff <laughs> if you're interested <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah that's where you'll see everything so awesome well people the links will be on the website so make sure you go check them out follow Gillian so you can keep track of everything she is doing and from the 14th to the 22nd of September you can watch Dandelion as part of 2024's Sci-Fi London right the number one sci-fi festival in the UK so make sure you do that because yeah dandelion's a very interesting look at grief and uh all of that jazz so Julian this has been fantastic thank, thank you so you. much thank you so much all right take care all right you too thanks bye bye bye